On August 20th, 2017, paramedic Hassan Subier said the following after the terrorist attacks in Turku, Finland, and I quote, the world is such a dark place, and if we don't help each other, who's going to help us? Is your world like the screen? Is it a colorless world full of conditions, stamping out creativity or difference? Or is this black blank screen a metaphor of our disconnected selves, alienated from others? At this moment in your lives, do you feel that you're no longer secure about your futures, about your world or your planet? Even with these trepidations, we tell our young people who are at the peak of their sense of immortality to develop that stiff upper lip and to imagine a world where they can succeed, perhaps even to follow the American dreams, rather than to face a world full of expectations and all the hard emotions like love, hate, anger, greed, or jealousy ready to challenge them. We don't prepare them to prevent world hunger and racism. We don't train them to face life the way it is. A double-edged sword, a yin and a yang, and to handle it together with others. You remember that Al Green song, we can never see tomorrow, no one told us about the sorrow. Do we instead construct a future for our children based on our own sanitized perceptions of what it means to succeed as an individual rather than as a citizen of a community of sentient beings now. I am here to say that we can no longer afford to continue to develop human beings without a sense of responsibility or accountability, without compassion for others, because our world, our planet, demands our attention now. In order for us to realize how dynamic we are, meaning that we are changeable and can enact change, we just need a change of perspective. Much of my training is in Buddhist studies, I'm, and I'm here today to help you to engage in contemplative exercises, what I'm calling applied Buddhism, for the single purpose of eliciting a perspective paradigm shift. The Buddhist tradition is all about mind training. I think with effective measures, we can empower our future generations now to end the cycle of selfishness, inequality, and greed later. So let's begin with having you reflect on three things that I hope will help you develop this perspective paradigm shift to elicit responses for the greater good. One, it's not all about you. <laughs> Two, you are a cat. Three, we are a dynamic community. One, it's not all ab about you. Or in Spanish, ni que fuera la última Coca-Cola del desierto. <laughs> Let's begin. <laughs> Let's begin with a tale about a man who, as he walked through a village, witnessed all sorts of ailments. An elderly man barely able to see or walk bursting boils on a moaning woman's face, a decomposing corpse on a funeral pyre. What is this, he asked his charioteer as he faced his person. The charioteer answered, this is old age, or this is sickness, or this is death, ending with, this will happen to you. The young man in the prime of his life was no longer satisfied or secure about his surroundings, pleasures, or future. In facing others' ephemerality, he faced his own. He no longer felt attached to a limited life of self-gratification and became aware of the interdependence of all existence. He became known as the Buddha, the enlightened one, fueled with compassion. It's a great story, one that many of my students remember even after they graduate. Now let's think about things a little bit. Throughout our lives, 
We are so obsessed about our identity and our own situations. We may ask the question, who am I? What will I be? What will I gain? What will I lose? Who loves me now? And we think that if we answer these questions, we will be happy. We are trained to be such a self-absorbed world. Let's be honest, when somebody considers to pursue a career in, let's say, medicine, for example, is it completely for altruistic reasons in order to help humanity? Or is it for her own security? Is there no inkling of the pleasures gained from getting a good salary or prestige? You remember how the film Doctor Strange began. We may experience humbling moments when we witness debilitating disease or death. But how often do we take those moments as turning points in our lives rather than turning away from those conditions and those with the conditions as if they are contagious? According to the Buddhist tradition, we are all selfish beings trapped dissatisfied in our own cycles of self-created habitual behavior dictated by our changeable emotions. Ouch. Selfishness is the cause of our drives and anguish throughout our lives. We cling to things that are changeable. One of the major strategies used to overcome perspectival limitations is to focus on opportunities, not in terms of material gain or prestige, but those potentially life-changing experiences. One of the most powerful stories in the Buddhist tradition is the story of a woman who lost everything, her husband, children, home. And she appeared before the Buddha carrying her dead baby and pleading to him to regain his life. The Buddha's response to her was to go find a home that had not experienced death and report back to him. As we could all guess, she never found that home. She realized that it was no longer possible to continue living a life in which she was the only thing that mattered. She was living in a community of fellow sufferers. She served others thereafter, as the Buddha did. Death is a great equalizer, shaking our alienated sense of reality and reminding us of the greater good we are capable of beyond ourselves. I remember when I had a car accident a few years ago. I distinctly remember when the two cars collided. The force put me in a dreamlike state, as if an eternity, but likely lasting only a few seconds, my car and I were flung onto oncoming traffic and then to a field when I suddenly realized where I was and I forcibly hit the brake. All of a sudden, I felt excruciating pain in my pelvis from the impact of the seatbelt. I remember thinking it was no longer possible to have children now. And I remember asking how the other person was, if he was okay. At that moment, I realized that life can change so quickly. Life can end so quickly. But I was given the opportunity to change my perspectives about my limitations and regrets, to appreciate the gifts that I had been given, and to consider that perhaps I can make a difference in the life of a child out there. However we experience our pain, the Buddhist tradition notes that it is not until we put ourselves in other people's shoes, literally, that we can begin to understand others and make responsible decisions. Two, you are a cat. William Blake, in his Marriage of Heaven and Hell, wrote, how do you know but every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed by our senses five? This striking poem makes us aware that we as human beings cannot see past our limitations. What impact does awareness of others' perspectives, 
humans and other species have on our own sense of reality about our interdependence. Well, let's begin with the statement, you are a cat. I begin with a cat because if you have an extraordinary one like I do, then you know what I mean. I see a cat as the embodiment of interdependence and independence in nearly perfect harmony in his gentle and wrathful nature. <laughs> My cat, Boo Boo, immerses himself in physical affection with me on a daily basis, and he also retreats in meditative calmness. <laughs> he can be gentle and very sensual as he purrs near my ear as I fall asleep at night, and rather aggressive when he has caught and decapitated a small defenseless bunny. <laughs> One day I was surprised by his reaction. My elderly mother was staying in our guest bedroom in Texas uh, when all of a sudden she experienced what seemed like an angina attack. No one heard her gasp except for Boo Boo, who flung from where he was napping on the other side of the house a good 43 feet of walking distance, jumped on her bed, and put his paw on her chest. Then he lied down next to her, which seemed to calm my surprised mother. At that moment, I didn't know who my cat was. Was he a cat and I a human, or was it the other way around? What do I call my cat's reaction? Heightened feline senses? When my cat jumped to my mother's bed and put his paw on her chest, he didn't seem to want to be fed or petted, especially from my mom who feared cats. Unknown to us, my cat Boo Boo experiences his world of delight in perfect equanimity, according to his own rules, and then gives unconditionally. An image called Cat's Eye, painted by the Japanese Buddhist research biologist Iwasaki Sunail, drives the message home. Upon seeing himself re reflected in the eyes of a stray cat he had been feeding, Iwasaki instantly saw himself. There was no separation. When one sees reality as it is, undistorted by emotions, one can see oneself in everything. But how do we see ourselves in others who cause us pain, whom we feel do not deserve compassion? For a perspective paradigm shift, we need to first begin to break the barriers between ourselves and others before we can make a difference in the world. One of my favorite visualization exercises is Meta Bhavana, loving kindness meditation aimed at developing equanimity and compassion. It begins with a meditation, developing uh, loving acceptance of yourself, and then it systematically works at developing loving kindness toward others by visualizing four types of persons, one at a time, until they all surround you. One, a respected beloved person like a teacher or mother. Two, a loving person like a friend. Three, a neutral person, someone you know but have no special feeling towards. And four, a hostile person or enemy. I often add other strategies like imagining these individuals being ill and breathing in their illnesses and thinking that perhaps they may have been your mother in another, another lifetime. <laughs> How willing are we to face and feel compassion towards and trade places with perhaps a terrorist who has just hurt innocent people. Meditations like these allow us to experience our feelings in a safe space without physically confronting others, face shared suffering, and provide foresight, foresight on how we can potentially react. In exchanging ourselves, it also tests our capacity for unconditional love. I will always remember how a student reacted when she struggled trying to visualize who, her grandmother, who she considered to be her greatest enemy in her life. In our self-consumption of hurt feelings, we fail to realize the inevitability of change. Three, we are a dynamic community. 
In 1977, a model community, community adjacent to a canal fed by Niagara Falls was revealed to be a toxic waste dump, including at least 21,000 tons of toxic chemicals. This was ironically Love Canal. The New York State Health Commissioner at the time, David Axelrod, called the incident a, quote, a national symbol of a failure to exercise concern for future generations, close quote. Those of us as educators and parents are concerned about our young people's future about their security. I am asking here to encourage them to make a difference for the sake of the planet because the security of all impacts the security of one. As an academic, I'm concerned about the corporatization of our educational institutions. We are graduating students, many who are highly medicated, who target what they think of as practical majors in order to land a job or career rather than focusing on those other courses and those other experiences that may expand their minds and perhaps develop the empathy in an increasingly alienating world. While I was living in China for a couple of years, I remember encountering Chinese academics who were concerned about producing graduates who were linear in their thinking, targeted in their skills, and poor in their communication. They had the tech skills to land a job, but lacked the people skills to keep them and succeed. They identified the reason for this as a lack of a liberal arts education in China. I think we should equip our young people with a broad range of knowledge, reflections, and experiences with others unlike themselves. They especially need strategies to face challenges. Rather than developing students with a one-track perspective, let's develop the whole human being who looks to the other side as he or she plans for his future so that he does not become simply a company head who ambitious to build a model community without thinking about the future ramifications on the environment so that she does not drive toward a medical career without including reaching out to local communities and to third world countries. Rather than limiting themselves to the bottom line on a spreadsheet, they should reach out to seek collaborative ventures for the sake of others. I think we should develop human beings who think first of others rather than their own security unlike so many did in North Dallas after the Houston flood disaster. Hoarding gallons of gasoline and leaving others like me without any. Because whatever we do as individuals has an impact on everyone, including the whole universe. As astrophysicist Pete Hutt stated, life is a laboratory. I think that if we work together as a dynamic community, we can make a difference to end the cycle of selfishness, inequality, and greed later. Thank you. Thank you.